from the moment my eyes open, I know what I'm going to do from pretty much start to finish. I also found too that you can submit to someone when you trust them implicitly mm. and you know that they're truly leading you in the right direction. Yeah. It's, it's easy to belittle someone. It's easy to point out what the, the bad parts are about an individual. But when you can just sit back and be like, you know what, we're in this place now, but what are the good qualities about this man? We're, what other things has he done? What can I look at that's positive about this situation? We were separated when I got pregnant with Riley. We were like, done. It's a wrap. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Brandi Harvey. I am so excited that you have decided to join us here at Vault Empowers Talks. Now, you know, every month we bring you exciting, wonderful conversations with inspiring people, and this day is no different. So before we get started, I need you to like, I need you to share, I need you to hit the subscribe button because we got some good stuff on the way. I'm excited about this conversation today. Halani Blake Lobdell, better known as Mrs. Two Weeks Out on Instagram. She is a retired battalion chief, serial entrepreneur, TV personality, realtor, wife, and mother. There is nothing this woman does not do. As the co-owner of the Loft Atlanta, one of the most sought after gyms in the city, Halani has gained the trust and support of women and men looking to achieve more than fitness goals. Launching Body Envy, which she is wearing today, you know she is representing. In 2020, Halani created a whirlwind of success and a seven-figure business that not only includes apparel, but coaching programs, eBooks, supplements, and now real estate. Halani is a woman who believed her fears were worth facing. If you are ready, Vaught Empowers Talks, welcome Miss Halani. Blake Labdell to the show. Mrs. Two Weeks Out. Hey, thank you for, look, that introduction, you gave me chills. That Amen. Was great. That's the spirit <laughs> moving. That was amazing. <laughs> I couldn't have done it better myself. Thank you for having me. I am excited. I'm excited. I ran into you the other night yep. and I said, I am so looking forward to this conversation. Yep. So looking forward because you are more than body envy. You're more than the loft. You are a multifaceted woman. I'm excited to talk to you. Thank you. Me too. I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah, because you said at 18 years old, what you would have told your 18 year old self, you said you were not the dreamer. You were, you were always thinking about the right thing and what was going to be consistently coming in, the checks clearing at the same time every yeah. single month. But you said that you would have told your 18 year old self to dream bigger and believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. What did you envision for yourself then? And what about now? You know, growing up, I didn't really envision much. And it's crazy mm -hmm. because I, I've talked about this very openly. I just, the, the household I came from, we were very well off financially, but our dynamic as far as the personal interaction, the love, all of that wasn't there. And we never really discussed like our futures, how to plan, none of that, you know? So I really didn't have many aspirations. It's just kind of like I was existing. Mm -hmm. And so fast forward to now, I dream so big and yeah. I understand now that, you know, we're in certain positions in life because we're okay with being there. And so I know I can do anything, like literally, like whatever it is that Halani decides, I might wake up today and be like, I, I want to be in real estate. Okay, well, shoot, what do I got to do to be in real estate? You I know? mean, what, <laughs> what hit the switch for you? Because most people see you as one way. Yeah. They see you as the fitness chick, you know, always looking two weeks out <laughs> from the show. I don't know about that now, but... <laughs> I mean, as a person who has done a fitness show yeah. uh, many, many moons ago, baby, you look two weeks out all <laughs> the time. That. You and Jason. <laughs> so, yeah. So what hit the switch? You have made a transition in your life to be in real estate, even yeah. at this point. Yeah. I think it's now um, my circle of friends, mm. my circle of friends, my mentors that I actually have in my life now. It's almost as if they, they won't allow me to just be complacent. They won't allow me to sit still. There's always like, what, what do you want to do next? Yeah. What do you want to do? And then I have to say, my husband, he's instrumental. So, of course, when we're having pillow talk and I'm just talking about the things I want to do, the things yeah. I like, and it's like, well, what do you want to do with those things, you know? And that's really, that's how the real estate thing came about. I've always loved, I've, I'm obsessed with homes. Just the, the your home infrastructure. is gorgeous. Every Thank time you. I see it on your Instagram. And I built that, yeah. you know, that was, we, we bought a floor plan and 
I made it our own, you know, just even to the the, the minute details. That's me, yeah. you yeah. know. And so if I see a house under construction, I'm going inside. Mm. And as it gets, you know, as it progresses and they've got, you know, the fixtures in and, you know, I'm in there. Yeah. Whether I'm crawling through a window or I'm forcing <laughs> my way in. And so he's like, you need to get into real estate. You would do really, really well. But, you know, being human, having limited doubts, some, you know, limited mm. beliefs at times. I was like, I don't have the time for it. And so I just made a decision, like, you know what, I'm going to do it. And I signed up. I did a two-week course and two weeks, knocked it out, put everything else on pause. Mm -hmm. Everyone knew, my family knew, like, hey, I got to lock in for these two weeks. My kids yeah. were on board. It was right before we took Raleigh to college. And um, completed it and took the state test two days later and passed that. Yeah. And it's been, I'm in, <laughs> what, week two of operating wow. as an agent, you know, wow. as a realtor. And I'm like all the way in like yeah. laser focused yeah. on this you know yeah. every morning i'm eat breathing sleeping real estate right now because like you said i'm no more for the fitness industry yeah. being a firefighter being a realtor is new so yeah. now i have to educate myself so that people can build that trust in me as their realtor like they have with fitness and everything else yeah. that you know i've done in the yeah. past you you become a real trusted source for people and one of the things that you said in one of your interviews is that you are very intentional about your day. And I think that plays into you taking a course for two weeks yeah. and buckling down and getting the job done. And so how are you very intentional about your time and your day with so many different things going on? Yeah, my calendar is my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> like literally everything has, if it's not on that calendar, yeah. I'm going to miss it. But that comes from my paramilitary environment. That comes from the fire service, like literally having to be if you're on time, you're late, you know, and so waking up at 430 in the morning, being at work by at least 530 to start my shift at six o'clock, you know, and having the day planned out because you've got administrative duties you have to take care of mm -hmm. in the midst of also running your calls that you can't plan. Yeah. And so that translated into just better time management for me because. I can get idle where I'm watching TV and, yeah. you know, yeah. I like my reality show. Yeah. So I'm laying in the bed and I'm watching. I'm like, I haven't done anything all day. Mm. And so it's one of those things like from the moment my eyes open, I know what I'm going to do from pretty much start to finish. Unless, you know, something pops up that I have to address. But for the most day, every single day is planned with what my priorities are. Once I get that out of the way, then I can chill and I can watch TV if I want to. I can kind of goof off. But I have certain things I have to get done every single day. And I literally plan it out. Journaling has been a big thing that, mm. and I have to say, I don't do it as much as I used to, but I used to do a brain dump. So I'd wake up in the morning and write down everything that I have to do. Cause it sounds, it seems so overwhelming sometimes in your head. Like I gotta do all this stuff, how am I gonna get it done? Yeah. But then when you write it out and you see like, it really isn't that much. And if I do this, this time at this time and this at this time, then I can get it all done. Yeah. And so that kind of helps me to set the tone for the day and really be intentional about what I'm doing. Yeah. Being intentional. Yeah. Planning is key. Yes. You come from a paramilitary background mm -hmm. as a chief battalion officer in the fire department. Yeah. Your mom is the one who kind of told you she gave you the nudge yeah. to become a firefighter she did she said you weren't doing nothing during the day or something right i was going to georgia state but you... i was so bored <laughs> <laughs> she's like you need to do something and she she lit that fire and you know she started kicking herself once i got in there because she yeah. would worry about me so much but yeah she's yeah. the one yeah yeah so you have this paramilitary background mm -hmm. that keeps you very organized and regimented do you think that that's been a part of your success of having that very disciplined idea of your day and your life and leadership? Absolutely. Yeah. Because that is such an intense environment where, you know, you've got lives that you're protecting yeah. for 24 hours, you know, between the citizens. I was with DeKalb County, so for the citizens of DeKalb, plus my guys and girls that I was responsible for for those 24 hours. So it kind of makes you just have a different outlook on what's important and what's not. And it really, really sets the structure for me. You know, sometimes I'm like, you need to relax a little bit because yeah. I can kind of just be like, no, it's got to be done right now. Yeah. You know how I say to get it done. But that is truly how, that's why I am the way I am. That's why I'm organized. That's why I'm kind of like, 
I'm kind of militant in a sense. You have a very <laughs> no nonsense kind of personality. Yeah, that's me. That's the energy I get from you. It is. Like you ain't taking no shit. None. From nobody. And, and my cutoff <laughs> game is so strong. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, if it doesn't serve me, yeah. if it's something that I, I don't like, you know, it's one of those things. I'm like, it's not for me and I'm good. I'm okay with that. Yeah. And I'm okay with saying, I don't. I don't want to do this. I'm not going to do it. Like, yeah. what is peer pressure? I don't give in to peer yeah. pressures. I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not going here. See y'all later. Love you, but I'm not coming. Yeah. You know, no problem saying no. No problem cutting certain things out of my life that just don't serve a purpose for me any longer. And I think that really plays a part because I've seen so much over those 18 years that just make me look at life different than I'll say somebody that's maybe never seen death to that extent. Mm. And that really, really plays a role in just how I rationalize everything. It yeah. sticks with you because that is that was my life, you know. And so I've been retired for two years now. But yeah. still, you know, majority 18 years, this yeah. is what I did. So, yeah. yeah, it definitely creates that no nonsense. Like, I don't have time for this. Yeah. yeah, that it comes from that. How hard is that to take that hat off for 18 years? And you've been married for over 20 years. Yes. So over 20 years, you've been a wife mm -hmm. and most of that a mother. Yes. Right. So how hard is that to take off that hat <laughs> and come into the house and be the wife and the mother and be submissive and all the things everybody <laughs> talks about online these days, you right. know, a woman being submissive and not having a job. Okay. <laughs> so you are all the opposite of that. Complete oh, opposite. Yeah. It was rough because, you know, you're on yeah. and you're on every third day. And so literally I would come in the house in the morning and I'd open the door and I'm like on a rampage, on a war path. Like, why are the dishes in the sink? Why? I cleaned up before I left. What are y'all doing? You know, yeah. everybody needs to get up. You know, yeah. I'm just like on the war path. And you're I'm, the chief. Right. You come right. in. You I came in and I'm like, y'all going to get up and do what I'm telling you yeah. to do. You know? Yeah. And I remember one day Jason was like, listen, when you pull up in that garage, yeah. You take those boots off at that garage <laughs> door. When you walk in this house, you don't run anything. Yeah. And he's put it to me like that. And I was like, okay. Yeah. He's right. You know, yeah. I can't come in here with that same energy. This is not that. This is my home. Yeah. This is my peace. I can't come in here like that. But it was hard for me to flip the switch and even harder to be that submissive wife that kept her mouth shut when I needed to. Yeah. That was so hard because literally I'm like, He's telling me certain things. I'm like, no, yeah. I don't want to do that. Yeah. No. But in, in the big picture is he's my head at the end of the day. This is what I took vows to do, to mm -hmm. be in submission to him. But I also found, too, that you can submit to someone when you trust them implicitly. Mm -hmm. And you know that they're truly leading you in the right direction. Yeah. And so once I let my guard down, like, this man loves me. He yeah. has me and our children's best interests at heart in everything that he does. Let him let him lead. Like, listen, just shut up. Yeah. And once I let, because coming from my background, my family dynamic, I'm like, I don't trust men. Mm. I saw my dad cheat on my mom repeatedly. I have a brother from his extramarital affair. You know, I saw the abuse physically and mentally. And I'm like, I'm not submitting to a man so he can do that to me. Mm. And Jason told me one day, like, I'm not your father. Yeah. I'm not your father. Like, stop putting me into this box with your father. And it hit me like, dang, I didn't even realize that that was having such a profound effect on my own marriage. This the this hang up that I had, yeah. this childhood trauma that I had never gotten over. Mm. So I didn't go to counseling. Like, what yeah. the heck was that? You yeah. know? So once I realized, like, you can't group all men into this box because this is what you experience from, you know, the person that's supposed to teach you what you're supposed to want from a man and set that example, you can't do that. Yeah. And once I let that guard down and kind of just put all of those things to the side, I was able to really receive him yeah. as the man I needed to and be able to submit. So now it's easier, Yeah. but it was a process. So talk about that process a little bit, because I think most women, we often say, well, I'm a boss at work. And when I come home, I can hit the switch. Yeah. And you're saying it wasn't that easy. Mm -hmm. And so many women think that it is. Well, I can be the leader for the majority of my day, eight, 10 hours of my day. I'm the leader, I'm the one in charge. Mm -hmm. And then I can come home and hit the switch. And you're saying there is a process to that. It absolutely is. And I think that's where 
I hate this term, but women who have the masculine energy comes in. You know, these men. You was on a whole podcast talking about that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and I had to, you know, people were tagging me like, you got to go talk to these dudes. But, yeah. you know, you, it's not that we have masculine energy. It's that we have roles and responsibilities. And it's hard to come in and transition and turn that off because as women, being in these positions that really weren't necessarily created for us. Yeah. Yeah. And now we've stepped in and yeah. we're fulfilling these roles. Yeah. And you have to position yourself to really be better than the men who your your you know, your male counterparts because Absolutely. they're waiting for you to make a mistake. They're waiting to say, Yeah, this is why we don't need women in these positions. They're especially women of color. They're waiting to say these things. And so you find yourself always like proving yourself every time you step foot in those doors of your workplace. So then you get home and it's like, you're still proving, you're still proving to a certain extent, mm. but that's where that trust comes in. Like for me personally in a marriage, I don't want a man who I can dictate. I don't want a man. I can just maneuver any way I want to. I want a strong head. That's what I signed up for. That's what I prayed for. That's what I married. And so you got to let them do just that. But if you're that opposing force with every single thing, I mean, at some point you're going to break them down to, I don't even want to deal with you because yeah. you're nothing but a headache, yeah. you know? And so it comes with, for me, first and foremost, I think is a self-evaluation of what is it that you want in your, in your home and providing that peace to them and in turn them providing it to you. Yeah. But you got to do a self-examination. How do I need, to, what changes do I need to make to soften up and to turn off, you know, that, that persona that I put on when I walk through those doors in my nine to five or whatever your schedule is, what do I need to do to turn that off when I get home? Cause this is your place of refuge. Yeah. You don't have to be on at home. This is where you can be yourself. You can let your hair down. You can be vulnerable. You can be all those things. So if you're not doing that, when you enter the four walls of your home, why? Yeah. Figure that piece out. You know, for me, I was my own, you know, worst, worst. I, I was at my worst because of what I was bringing to the table from my childhood. Yeah. And so once I was able to say, you're bringing that into the present, you got to let that go in order to be successful in your marriage. And once I figured that out, it was like, this is a no brainer. Yeah. You know, this works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause you said in uh, one of your interviews that you never heard, I love you from your father. Those were words that you didn't hear. Yeah. And so then you get into a marriage very young because you were how old when you got married? 19. 19 years mm -hmm. old. No one's really writing out lists of all the things that they want and desire <laughs> right? at 19. So what was it about Jason that dropped your guard and released that fear of loving someone? Yeah. So Jason is super affectionate. Sometimes he seems that uh, way. Y'all are like joined at the hip, but it doesn't feel unhealthy though. No, it's not. It's not. It's it's a very healthy balance. Y'all look like best friends every we time. We are, I see you. and that's what we yeah. built too. We 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 built a friendship. We were friends first before yeah. we even thought about anything romantically. But for him, he's a very affectionate person, and he's he's very vocal on how he feels about me, mm. whether we're in private or we're in public, and um, his his childhood was different. He heard, I love you. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, his father is in prison for life for murder. Oh wow. His father still told him he kissed him. I love you. He still had that healthy dynamic from his mom as well with me. I didn't know what that was like. Mm -hmm. My dad never said that. And I don't know if I will say, I won't say, I don't know. My dad's Jamaican yeah. and their culture growing up was very much. They were very poor. Mm -hmm. he, he had two other brothers. They had to share the same undershirt growing up, you know? So, I understand now as an adult, like, it's just a domino effect. He gave us what he received, you know, and he didn't see the need to change yeah. that. Yeah. And for me, I saw a need. So when I found somebody or when someone was showed me so much love, so much attention, so much affection, it was kind of like, this is a lot, but I've been lacking this my whole life. And that was one of the things he's kind, he's he'll compliment, you know, it's just, he just does all the things to make you feel like you're, you're that person. Like yeah. there's no one else in the world, but you. Yeah. And that really made me just be super, super comfortable with him. And he's still like that now. Like sometimes he'll say, you're so, you're not affectionate. <laughs> and I'm like, I am affectionate. I'm not maybe as affectionate <laughs> as you, yeah. but I am, but he's very, very, yeah. he's always been like that. Yeah. But you said that even in you all's relationship, when you talk about the trust, 
that you knew that you could depend on him, that he was reliable. Mm -hmm. And you told a story. I want you to tell the story of y'all were in your first apartment. Yeah. yeah. So we were trying to get to our first yeah. apartment and we were living um, with his mom. And we, we said two weeks we're going to be here because we had already, you know, put in the application. Yeah. But we needed the deposit first and last month. And we, we didn't have it. Yeah. So at the time, he was a club promoter. So he went out and he set up a park. He made a parking lot, basically. He went and got these cones and loaded up our... Um, this man has ingenuity. Does he ever? <laughs> He's innovative. What? And, I mean, <laughs> everything. And it was, it was ingenious back then, but he... Went and got these cones and set up parking for the yeah. club. And he came home that night. He was like, I got first month's rent, last month's, and we can furnish this whole yeah. thing. Yeah. And it was just from him just having the tenacity to be able to yeah. be like, I got to make something shake. Yeah. And he did. And yeah. that was like key to me. Like this dude will get it out the mud. Yeah. And he always has ideas. And sometimes I'm like, nah, I don't know about that. But he always gets it done. And whatever mm. he envisions, no matter if it's a business, no matter if it's something materialistic, no matter if it's something that he wants for us as a family, he gets it. It might take a, a little while, but it ends up happening because he's always working towards something. Yeah. So he's different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you all have had the capacity for one another to watch and learn each other through the evolution. Yeah. 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 And that's that's the real part. That's the real test. Yeah, because a lot of people, they grow apart during the evolution. Yeah. But we are finding that we're getting closer as yeah. we evolve. But I think that plays a part because we, we do it together. We're not separate in how we're evolving. It's kind yeah. of like, what do we need to do for us as a family? Like even with Riley being gone now, our family, family dynamic has changed. So that's part of an evolution too. Now we're thinking about, well, dang, shoot, Kingston's in high school in three years, we won't have our children in our home anymore. Like, what does life look like for yeah. us, you know? Yeah. And so we're not thinking in an individual sense. It's us. It's always what does it look like for us? Mm. Where do you see us in five years? Okay, where do I see us in five years? And we're trying to make our visions come together so we can stay on the same page. Yeah. Yeah, so we do it. It's, it's got to be aligned. Yeah. Got to. Got to be aligned. Because mm -hmm. you're going to hit some storms. Absolutely. In 2015, you all hit a major storm. Yeah. So there was some financial depression. There was some resentment that happened. Talk about what 2015 taught you. What did it show you and what did it teach you? Yeah. So like you said, in 2015, that was our lowest point, financially especially. Um, and it was a test to our marriage. So, you know, quick recap, he decided to pretty much pivot from, with a trucking company, pivot from that to going into the gym space full time. But he took a huge pay cut. So he went from making um, six figures a year to now only making $500 a week. Wow. Right. Wow. We had just gotten, bought, wow. a, bought a new home. You know, our children young. Kingston was four. So Riley was seven at the time, you know, and it's like, we had a foreclosure letter. Yeah. He lost his car, hit this Mercedes, he won his S550, it's his favorite car. Yeah. He lost it, it got repossessed. And I'm sitting back like, this man has put us in a position. Mm. And that's how I'm thinking of it. But I could never verbalize it, because I didn't want to beat him while he was already down. Yeah. You know, it was, it, was, it was a trying time, but at the same time, in his mind, he's making this transition because he sees a bigger picture at the end. Mm. I'm looking at the now, like, yeah. hey, what are we going to do to pay this, these bills here? Yeah. We've got these children. We can thug it out when it's just the two of us. Yeah. But we got kids, you know. Yeah. And um, what are you going to drive? You know, I'm just thinking <laughs> about all these things that are just happening. And yeah. I did have a level of resentment for him. And I had to work a part-time job. I'm working 24-hour shifts at the firehouse. I get off the next morning, and I go straight to work on the ambulance service because we were EMTs, too. So I go work another between 8 to 12 hours to try to help to make ends meet. So that was what how I decided to handle the situation versus beating him down. And, like, you you can see just from us sitting here, my personality can be a little strong sometimes, you know. Very straightforward. Very straightforward. My yeah. face shows every you emotion. You hit point quick. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so it's like I could not be that during that time because I think about now how – we've been able to navigate. And I'll say that that probably that transition really set us up for where we are today. And had I been that wife that was like, you know what, you need to go get a job. Yeah. You know, this is be your fault. This is why we're in this position. I can't stand you. You know, we're arguing all the time. 
I probably would have wore him down to the point where he wouldn't even have be, be where he is in business now because I wouldn't have been that support for him. And I find that just in a marriage, those are the times that really test who you are yeah. in your marriage, yeah. you know? It's, it's easy to belittle someone. It's easy to point out what the, the bad parts are about an individual. But when you can just sit back and be like, you know what, we're in this place now, but what are the good qualities about this man? Where, what other things has he done? What can I look at that's positive about this situation? Yeah. And it's hard in the moment. Yeah. You have to, and that's another, you got to be intentional about your thoughts during that time. And I'm thankful to this day that I didn't do what Halani normally does. Which is. And go off about you know, how I feel about it. Because he really, really set us up for something beautiful that we're currently in now. Yeah. So as a wife in that moment, what advice would you even give to another wife who's in her own storm? Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to a wife? You know, the storms are temporary. It's just a matter of how you ride it out. And you have the ability to set the tone for what that looks like for you and your family. You know, these these storms that come in, we can't control them 100%, but you control, can control your reaction to those storms. Yeah. So you have total control over yourself. So that's the moment where you gotta be willing to ride it through and know that on the other side, what do we always have after a storm? There's always sunshine, there's maybe a rainbow that comes yeah. out, and it's beautiful afterwards. So if you can ride it through and stand that test, What's on the other side? Yeah. You got to see past it. You know, and I am, I don't think all storms need to be written out. You know, some storms are just, hey, this is what it is and it's done. But when we're talking about your partner making a move because they think it's something that will be advantageous or beneficial for the family unit, yeah, see it through. Yeah, You know, and give them that space. Yeah. Give them that space to be able to do what they're trying to do to benefit. Now, if you're out here cheating and doing all that, and yeah. no, I don't have no space yeah. for that. We're yeah. not riding that storm out. Yeah. But for you to be doing something because it's for the overall benefit of your family, yeah, you got to be that support. You got to be that pillar. You got to be that partner that you took those vows to be during that time. Yeah. You said that Jason, even in all of his entrepreneurship ventures, he always created a space for you mm -hmm. in those ventures, yeah. in those different endeavors. And one of those is The Loft, mm -hmm. Atlanta. And so you started a glute camp, mm -hmm. you started doing a class at the gym, which became very popular, which then led into you doing body bands yeah. and then an apparel line. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So talk about how him making space created an even bigger space for your family. Yeah. So Jason's always been a serial entrepreneur. I was against entrepreneurship. One. <laughs> you wanted that. that consistent check coming yes, in. Yes, I, I need know to know. Getting. I need yeah. to know every two yeah. weeks was coming. I need to know what I can count on. Yeah. And so I've just always been like that. And so I'm like, you take the risk. I'm going to be the, the stability yeah. in the situation. Yeah. So what, I didn't even realize what he was doing. So every single business that he set up, he always made something for me. So like you said with the loft, it was come teach a class here, which turned into glute camp. Um, with our online program, X28, it was you want to do a program in here? So I have a program called Lower Body Blast within that. He's always been like, come along the journey. Yeah. I didn't realize that it really was subconsciously grooming me to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. You know, and so I'm thankful for it. So when I did make that transition, um, because then, of course, Body Envy came along. Yeah. And um, it came along and it did some things that I just didn't expect. I mean, just out of this world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. completely out of this world. I didn't expect it. It was one of those things like, what am I going to do? You know, I didn't even know how to, I didn't know what being an entrepreneur was, you know. Yeah. So that was my time to lean on him like, how do I do this? How do I navigate through this? I mean, you know, all the things that come about. But him creating that space for me it, it turned me into who I am now, and it really brought us closer mm -hmm. because he always considered me. Even though I was against it, it was like, this is what we're doing. And in order for us to stay close where she's not going in this direction, I'm going in this one, I'm going to make sure she has a place here so yeah. I feel like I'm a part of it. Whether That's a I good want husband. It. He's a good husband. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this man. That's why we rocking 21 yeah. years in, you know, yeah. married. But, yeah, he's he – he really set me up for success, and I didn't even realize it. Hmm. Even though you didn't always want to take his advice. No, I still don't. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we like that? I don't even get it. Why it's hard like for that? you to take his advice sometimes. Yeah. Why is that? 
I don't know because he's I, so familiar, probably. I, and you know, because and that that's probably is it. He's so familiar. He knows everything about yeah. me, right? Yeah. So when he like he told me one time, he was like, um, "You're operating at thirty percent of your capacity." Meanwhile, I feel like I'm tired, right? Oh, I'm doing Lord. everything. I'm going balls to the wall. I'm like, what do you mean? It was an insult. What do you mean yeah. 30%? Yeah. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And he's like, yeah, but what? what's it yielding? Hmm. You're busy. Yeah, you're busy, but you're not productive in any way. How is what you're doing, hmm. like, contributing to the overall goal? Yeah. And it's like, dang. Hmm. But it hurts sometimes to hear the truth, especially when it's coming from the person that you lay your head next yeah. to every night. Yeah. But at the same time... Why would you not want to hear the truth from the person you lay your head next to every night? I need it. Right. 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 Don't be fake with me. Yeah. Because we need it for our survival. We need it. We need the truth. Because that's the light. Those hard yeah. conversations. Yeah. We need it. And especially yeah. from somebody who you can trust because you know there's no ulterior motive. It literally is because you need to hear this information. Yeah. So I can say I'm a little better now with receiving yeah. from him. Yeah. But, you know, I don't and I don't know because you talk to other wives and other just other people in relationships. And they're like, I don't want to hear it from him. Mm. Or I don't want to hear it from her. Can you talk to him? Do you talk to her? I don't know why we're wired that way. I really and you're know. like, I want to hear from him. Now? Yeah. But even sometimes it's still, it's like, I don't receive it. Mm. And I have to sleep on it. And then the next morning, I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. I get what you're saying. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It just doesn't make any sense. So yeah. I need you to figure that piece out. That is not for me to figure out. I do not <laughs> jump in people's business like that. <laughs> but you create a body envy. Yeah. And you set a deadline. Talk about planning. Talk about uh, routine and needing to be yeah. consistent. You set a deadline mm -hmm. of October 27th to launch this business. Yes. And in the first month, you did $20,000. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if I don't have a deadline, it's, it's not... It's, it's kind of, I, I'm operating in dreamland. Yeah. I have to have hard deadlines with yeah. everything that I do. So really that October 27 deadline, there was no significance to the day outside of we just need to pick a date to launch because if we don't pick a date, we're never going to do it. Yeah. And so I do that with everything, even like with real estate. Once I passed my state exam, it was in a week's time, I will be with whatever firm I'm going to be with. And so I gave myself five days to go and interview these different brokerages and to find a home. I had, and I did it. That Friday, signed up my paperwork, went and filed it with the state and had everything set up. Mm -hmm. I have to have clear deadlines. And I feel like operating without a deadline, you're just aimless. Yeah, You're aimless. And so those deadlines create the consistency. Those deadlines create the work ethic. Those deadlines make you work towards something. Yeah. And if you don't have it, you're just out here, you know. And so I, I mean, everything has a deadline attached to it in order for it to make sense for me. Do you think that's why most people fail when they get into business? Because they don't put themselves on a deadline? That's part of it for sure. Yeah. Because they lack the... They lack the work ethic. They lack the drive. And it's one of those things where it's like, well, I work for myself. So because I work for myself, I, you know, I can, I can kind of do whatever I want to do. Yeah, you work for yourself, but you got to be even more strict with yourself than, say, you were when you actually had an employer. Yeah. Those employers set boundaries for you to work within. Absolutely. You got to set those boundaries even more so for yourself because you can have that flexible time space where you're getting nothing done. You got to work harder for yourself than you did for you know, your employer. So if they set parameters for you, why do you not set parameters for yourself to work with them? Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's essential. Those companies that are just out here and they have no systems in place, they don't have clear-cut deadlines, there's no consistency, there's no SOPs, there's just not that baseline, yeah, you're going to experience some form of failure, maybe faster or fail to the point that you can't recover because there's nothing in place to keep you, keep you structured. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you have an expectation to be a seven-figure business No. when you started? No. Absolutely. Most people on Instagram, they are out here like, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to have all the money. No. I'm going to be driving the roads and no. the Bentley truck. Mm -mm. You didn't have any of those thoughts? No, because I can be really hard on myself, right? Mm. So if I set expectations that are too high and I don't meet them when I set that deadline, yeah. then I feel like I have failed. And I know failure is okay. All of us fail in some form. It's like, what do you do with that, those failures, yeah. right? But I, didn't, I just don't set expectations when it comes to money. 
Like I'm like, yeah, I need to launch. I need to have these products. You know, I need to have certain people in place. But when it comes to money, I'm never really, I've never been driven by money. Mm. Even now, I tell him, all, Jason all the time, like, I just want to live a simple life. Like, if I could get off of social media, you know, I would. I would mm. disappear and just slump back. I didn't grow up in poverty. You know, my parents, we did very, very well. Your mom well. owned a daycare? She owned yeah, a daycare for 12 years. father was a sheriff? Yep, he was a sheriff. Mm. He, you know, and my mom, back in the 80s, she was making six figures. That's a lot back in yeah. the 80s. You know, yeah. we moved here from New York, and they basically bought our house cash when we moved here. Then she started the daycare facility, and... We didn't want for anything financially. But entrepreneurship was in your blood. It and it I never in, even and realized you never thought it. About it. Yeah, entrepreneurship was in my blood from my mom and public safety from my father. From your father. And I never ever yeah. put any of it together until just recently. You're the best of them. Yes, you're the best. Of and them. didn't think of it, but yeah. yeah, um, it's just kind of one of those things where, and I've lost my train of thought. We've been talking, and I'm like. <laughs> You're doing great. You set the deadline for Body Envy. There we go. You launched, but you never have financial expectations. expectations. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's why, because when, I don't even like talking about money. Mm. I don't even like talking about money. So when people talk about the success of it and all, why I'm is like, that? I don't know. I, I don't know. Was I, that growing up in a household that you all really just didn't discuss it? Did it feel taboo? You know, and I think now that you say growing up in a household, you know, we were known, I was known like, like the rich girl yeah. in high school. That's the rich yeah. girl. You know, they live over here in this neighborhood. And I used to hate that. Yeah. Hated that because it's like, what does that mean? You know, does I'm not better than you because my yeah. parents have more money than you. We, yeah. we at the same school. We in the same <laughs> class. You know, you got the same shoes on as me. That yeah. means nothing. And so I think that people just place money on such a high pedestal. And it's like there's so much more to people yeah. and just even business. Your business can be successful and you're making, you know, $10,000 a month. It doesn't mean that you're not successful because you're not having six-figure months, yeah. you know. And yeah. so my va I just don't place a lot of value on money. And I understand yeah. that money comes and goes. Yeah. But I'm I'm more in tune with the values that people have, the 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 what I experience going through the process of making the money. You know, I'm more tuned into that than actually what I make, if that makes sense. Yeah. You like the process. I like the process. I mean, obviously you are a former fitness competitor, mm -hmm. you've done multiple shows, so you trust the process yes. of all things. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You you trust the process. And you I love seeing it. I yeah. love seeing it's where, where it starts and where it ends. I yeah. love it. You're driven by the results. Yes. Driven by the results. Mm -hmm. But that didn't come easy to you because you didn't always believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. You didn't believe that you were going to be successful. And then you get this DM message yeah. <laughs> that really kind of set it off for you. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Yeah. So um, at the time I was getting a lot of merchandise from other companies, like just sending it to me and I would wear it and I would post it. And I had a message that came in from Chanel Kennard. She was misconceited back then. And she DM'd on me. On Instagram. On Instagram, mm -hmm. yes. Um, she DM'd me and she was like, sis, I don't know if the brand that you're wearing is yours and you're just not telling everybody, but if it's not, you need to have your own. Yeah. And it was the first time that I actually thought like, she's right. Absolutely right. I never, ever thought about having my own athleisure company. You know, I was wearing other people's things, and I was the biggest Nike supporter ever. Yeah. Like, everything was Nike, you know. And so I'm like, she's right. These people are sending me these things because I'm making other people buy their product. Yeah. So if I can make money for them, why can't I do it for myself? And so literally at that time, I was um, working on a show called Live Rescue on A&E. And so I was going up to New York to film that show. And I had extra money because I was getting income from that show. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take this money because it doesn't affect anything in my household. So if I start this business venture and I don't make a dime, yeah. it doesn't affect anything because yeah. this is extra, you yeah. know? So I took it. I started. I went to work one day, set up everything, my LLC, got my EIN number, like just set everything up, the, ba the basis for my business. And then I went on Alibaba and started sourcing products yeah. and just kind of vetting those vendors. And we just took off from there. But it came from that DM. It came from somebody who I'd only met one time, seeing something in me I didn't see in yeah. myself. 
And I think that that's so important. That's why, you know, I, I, I just saw her at InvestFest. She mm -hmm. was there. And I attribute so much to her because she didn't know me. Yeah. But she was gracious enough to come and let me know what she saw in me that I didn't see in myself. I love that. Yeah. Because my, my good friend Patrice always says there's somebody watching with the power to bless you. Mm. There's somebody watching. Yeah. And we don't always think, we don't know who's watching us, mm -hmm. who's tuning in to see how we're doing and how we're living. Right. But there's somebody who's watching you that's like, look, I got my eye on you, girl. Yeah. And if you could just step on out yeah. there, yeah. there's people who will support you. So how have you had to kind of fall in and lean into your support system? Because most women will look at you, they say, you're beautiful, you got the husband, the family, the wife, the nice whips, the money, and they don't understand that you have a support system that you have to fall into at times. Yeah. So talk about the women in your life that pour into you, that make you better. Yeah, so support is key because we get tired. We can have as many things as possible, but we, we're humans, we, we doubt ourselves at times, we just get worn out at times, yeah. you know? So I have to say, of course my mom, she's 81. Yeah. And she drives me crazy, that woman. She's not the average 81 year old, but I have her, my sisters. You um, have twin sisters. I have twin you sisters. You have twin yep. sisters. Yep. And you know I'm a twin. So yes. Yeah, you have twin sisters. That was very fascinating to me yes. when I learned that. I was like, oh, okay, what's your twin right? sisters be like? <laughs> and they are like night and day. We are too. Really? Listen, night and day. It's but we so are funny. best friends. Yeah. We're the best of friends. Yeah. yeah. And the three of us, we're very, very close. Yeah. They're five years older than me, but we are so, so close. Yeah. So I have them. And then I have, a f I don't have a lot of girlfriends, mm. but the girlfriends that I do have, I have um, Turquoise, her 500. She's also married. Her husband is an entrepreneur. One of my husband's really good friends. Y'all all rolling a little click together. We kind of do. Yeah, it's like the little Atlanta entrepreneur click. You know, and, 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 and we don't, I don't really want it to be a click, but you know, when you find your people. They're your tribe. Yes, yeah, yes. And yeah. you know that you can talk about things like yeah. She's maybe one of the few people I can talk to about marriage that mm, gets it because yeah. her husband's also in the entrepreneurial space, yeah. you know, that, you, that is different from somebody that works yeah. for someone in corporate America, maybe, yeah. you know, and then I have, I have my friend Shanta. Shanta is a, she is more like a motivational self-help coach, right? Yeah. So she is one of the very, very, very important people in my life who she'll pour into me. Like mm. she might sense like something might be off and she'll call me like, friend, let me talk to you for a second. And she's going in mm. and she's pouring and she's, and I do the same for her yeah. because I'll see certain things, you know? And so my support group is very, very important to me because it's an interchange of encouragement that we all need and just being in tune with each other to know when someone is off, when yeah. someone might be a little unresponsive and it's like, what's going on, you yeah. know? And just to be able to have that outlet that you need because everyone needs that breath of, I don't want to be on for social media. Yeah. I don't want to talk about business today. Yeah. I might not even want to be with my husband today. Yeah. I might need a break from my dog on kids. Yeah. And yeah. where can I go where yeah. I can be, feel safe? Even with Riley going away to school, that took me down. I could tell. I, I watched you when y'all dropped your daughter off. Yeah. Uh, you just dropped your daughter off freshman year. Yeah. And you could tell it was very emotional for the entire family. The whole family. Yeah. And mind you, Brandy, we had been gearing up for this for months. Of so course. For we months. know you had a plan. Oh, you, listen. You had target dates and deadlines. We did. And <laughs> we did. But my emotional, I could not plan for my emotions yeah. that I was going yeah. through, right? So knowing she was about to graduate from high school, like, I was getting depressed. Like, mm. she really is about to go somewhere. Yeah. She's really leaving the house. And so when she left and we dropped her off, when we got home that evening and I, we pulled into the drive when her car wasn't there, I just started crying and I could not stop crying. And I'm talking about it's hours later and I'm in my bed and I'm not like bawling, but the yeah. tears are just flowing. Yeah. And I told Jason, I can't stop crying. Yeah. And I found like each day was hard to get out of the bed. And he was like, hey, I need you to get around some love today. I need you to tap into your friends yeah. because you need to be surrounded yeah. by love that is you know not judgmental they're yeah. not wanting anything from you even if you guys just sit you need to be around that right now because it's a grieving yes it's it a grieving is. process it is there's a part of you that's leaving 
Yes. Yeah. And there's there's no way any parent can be prepared for that. Yeah. And I'm not that parent that's like, yeah, you 18, get on out of here. Yeah. Now, if you're 30 years old and you want to live with me, I'm fine with that. Just don't be a bum. But if you want to be 30 and live here, I'm fine. Yeah. But that support system really helped me get through it outside of, you know, Jason and, and Kingston, my son. But those, those girls really came together and yeah. really, really helped me get through because I'm still dealing with it. Yeah. yeah. It's only been a couple weeks. The wound yes. is very fresh. It's three weeks. Listen, but she coming home like every weekend. Come bless on. Her heart, Come on home. With a laundry bag <laughs> and ready to take a bunch of snacks back. And spending all our doggone money. <laughs> she needs some. She needs a class on financial management. Listen, I bet she does. She's like, look, my parents got it like that. Yeah, I'm like, no, not, not for you. You get an allowance and that is it. <laughs> So you talked about journaling, you talked about your friend group that mm -hmm. are very important, but what is your spiritual practice? Like what's a, what's a daily ritual that Halani has to do in order to center herself and be Mrs. two weeks out? Yeah. So I'm a very spiritual person. Yeah. So literally that really is what sets the tone for every single day for me. So the moment my eyes pop open, I say a prayer mm -hmm. because my eyes are open. I look next to me, he's awake. I hear Kingston stirring upstairs, you know, so I'm just thankful for the fact that we're alive. Yeah. And so I'm praying, I set the tone each day by prayer. I don't jump on social media. I don't get on social media until I probably have been up for over an hour before I even start checking on that. Mm. But I'm very big on prayer. I read my Bible every single day. Yeah. And I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And so you grew up Jehovah's Witness. I grew up. Yep. My and dad you still practice. I still practice. Oh, wow. So y'all ain't celebrating Christmas nope. and birthdays over there. None of that. What's going on? How ain't... you getting these gifts? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, because I grew up that way, like my dad, my dad was not a witness. My mom was mm. and her family is. OK. And so growing up, they really helped me to be able to build a way that my kids even me never felt like we were being left out because we didn't celebrate Christmas or birthdays yeah. because we got rewarded just constantly. It's so, about good deeds over there. That's it. It's good deeds. That's it. So it's like, you over don't have there, to wait. Over there, that watchtower. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. So I'm like, listen, you don't have to wait for Christmas to get these gifts. Yeah. You know, I'm going to reward you year round. You, mm. wanna, you want shoes? We don't have to wait until this day for you to get shoes. You want to go shopping? But at the same time, my my parents never let it, my mom really, my dad didn't really have a, a say so in it, but my mom never made us feel like we were outcasts. So when we went back to school after Christmas break, we had new stuff too. Yeah. We just didn't have a tree and open up gifts. Same mm -hmm. thing with my kids. It was like, you go back to school, you'll have your new gear and stuff too, but we're not going to have a tree and we're not going to open up the gifts and we're not going to send in Christmas carols, that type of thing. Your birthday rolls around. Okay. It's just another day, but understand that you get things year round, you yeah. know. My daughter got her first car when she was 15 before she could even legally drive, wow. you know. And so it's like, I don't ever want my children to feel like everything has to be centered around these days that holidays, holidays right, yeah. that the world glorifies. No, you can, you can have and do on all the other days too. Yeah. And so, yeah, so I've never really put a press, never have put a precedent on that. Yeah. And Jason coming in, was he a practicing Jehovah's Witness? No, he's okay. not. No. How was that? Yeah, so he did Because most people talk about, we not equally yoked yep, now. Yep. We don't go to the same church yep. and have the same denomination. Because that can be a struggle. Yeah, like, that so can really, talk about that. Yes, yeah, so he did not have a religious background. Mm. So that... I, so you were like very, very, like, opposites attract. Yes. No religious background, and you come with a, with a witness. With a witness. Hallelujah. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> and I have to say, I wasn't like a... a you weren't knocking on I people on Saturday. I wasn't a good witness back when I... <laughs> When we started dating, I wasn't, you know, but at the same time, I still had my values that I always subconsciously knew, mm, you know, you gave him a pamphlet. I did. <laughs> and I was showing him scriptures in high school. Like, this is what God's name is. Like, I need for you to know this, you know, and so <laughs> because he didn't have any religious background, he was able to allow me to take the lead spiritually. Mm. And he still does now mm. because he didn't grow up in any yeah. denomination, you know. Oh, wow. He, they didn't go to a specific church growing up. And so then he meets me and we go to the Kingdom Hall. Lord. And he's like, what is this? Then he comes and he's like, okay, this is a little different. It's not what I'm necessarily, yeah. what I've seen growing up the few times I've been. But he respects it because mm -hmm. he knows that we use the Bible as our guide. Mm -hmm. And if you believe in the Bible... And now he's learning because now he's on his spiritual path yeah. now. So this is the first time in 
being married to this man, being with him for 24 years, where I've seen him now praying and him mm. now, you know, reading the Bible yeah. and, and studying and yeah. delving deeper into the scriptures. Yeah. And I have to say, I think that has come about just from what he's seen over the years with us and the kids and just seeing that we've always been very much into our faith yeah. and we do, I don't compromise it. There was a time mm. where I did. Mm. Now, mm -mm, I don't compromise my faith. If it doesn't, mm. if it does not line up with the word, so to speak, I'm not doing it. Yeah. You know, did you pray for that in your marriage that he evolved spiritually? Absolutely. Mm. And I have to say, out of all the wonderful things that I've said about him talking to you, that was one of the things that I felt like we lacked was mm. me having, I have a, a head as a husband, but I didn't have a spiritual head. Mm. And so I will find that that's where a lot of uneasiness will come for me mm. is because I'm doing all these things. I'm running businesses. I'm working a job that's very stressful and demanding. And then I'm trying to take the lead spiritually for the family too, making mm. sure that we pray, making sure that we learn, making sure that we get to our, you know, the days that we worship, you know, making sure all those things happen. But I didn't have him to assist me with that. So I've been praying for years for this. Mm. And so now to see like, there's fruit. it's happening. Yeah, yeah there's it's fruit. It's so insane yeah. to me. And I just watching him evolve and watching him make a, a just an effort to just really, really tap in with God. It's amazing. Yeah, that's got to be beautiful because I think most people are looking for the Sierra prayer, like how to get the man. Yep. I want the Sierra prayer. Tell me what you said. Give yep. it to me specifically. Yeah. But the real test comes when you get him. Can you pray for him, with him, about him? Yes. So that you can undergird your family. Yes. And so that's the power mm -hmm. of a real wife and, and a woman, right? Yeah. Of a good woman. Yeah. Because yeah. that's, I mean, there's been situations like recently, he lost three very close people to him in death, mm -hmm. two of his best friends and his nephew last year. And so, you know, during that time, I'm like, we can't get through these things on our own. So we have to look to a higher source to get through this. Yeah. And I really, really, really concentrated on just grabbing his hands and praying with him and letting him know that don't blame God for these things. Yeah. He's not the reason why this has happened, you know, and really, really it's happening in that way. And then here we are getting ready to take Riley to school and I'm uneasy and he grabs my hands and he prays for <laughs> yeah, us, you know, yeah. and I'm like, Look at how things have Full turned. Full circle. Yeah. Full circle. Yeah. And it just shows you that you might pray for some things and it might take years, years before you start to see the fruit of what you're paying for, praying for, and, you know, coming to fruition. Yeah. But in his time, not ours, in his time. Yeah. And yeah, I'm sitting back like, who is this man? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm loving it. Because he's changed over the years. And over yeah. 21 years that y'all been married, 24 years that you've been together. Yeah. How has it been in the evolution of two individuals, but a couple together? Yeah, it's been, it can, it was trying at one point. Yeah. It was extremely trying at one point, especially when we were young, mm. because we got married at 19 and 20 before we were even of legal age to drink. Yo, frontal right? lobe is not developed until 25. Listen. And bless your heart, you out here with a soft brain. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> and acting like we got a soft brain too because we were living we were married but we were living like we were single really yeah i mean we're in the clubs he's still a club promoter i'm in the club every night you know with my girlfriends <laughs> and it's like then we coming home and we got issues because we're just not living like a married household should live yeah but it was just us and what do we know you know yeah. we're just like we're young we out of high school we we, we live in atlanta yeah. you know we just gonna yeah. do certain things but you know, but once we got on this, and it really was me getting pregnant with Riley mm. that made us say, we got to do something The different. pregnancy shifted. It shifted because we were separated when I got pregnant with Riley. We were like done. I had moved into an apartment. He had moved back home with wow. his mom. And it was like, it's a wrap. Arguing every day, the fighting, like. You were three years into the marriage at that point? Yep, almost three years into yeah. the marriage. And it was like, this is not for me. And like I said, coming from the childhood I had. I'm like, I am not wasting my life. Cut off game strong. What? I'm Black like, I'm game not doing good. this. I can't. Yeah. This is this is not life yeah. and this is not what I want. And I got pregnant with Riley. And it was one of those things like, what are we gonna do? Because hmm. we wanted a child. Yeah. And then it's like boom, here she, I'm pregnant. So we did not actually come back to live together until I was about eight months pregnant. Wow. Yep. I had to wow. go on bed rest. And Were you living with your mother or? I had my own apartment. Oh, yeah, you said that. Mm -hmm. own and apartment. he was living back at home. Back with his mom. With his mom. He back at his mama's yeah. house. He used to run in his mama's house all the time. <laughs> <laughs> 
that was his go-to. We run to my mama's yeah. house. But um, yeah, and so then it was just kind of like, we have to make a decision what we're going to mm. do. And so we decided to come back together. And I'm thankful for it. And we, we've told her, like, you really saved you us. You were the little angel. Yes. You were our angel. Yes, you saved yeah. our marriage. And that made us have just a different approach to how we do life. Like, mm. this is our life together. We got married to do life together in every sense of the word. So that's why it's like we seem like we're glued at the hip. Why do I need to go everywhere without you? Why? You're supposed to experience this with me and vice versa, you know. And we do give each other space. You yeah. know, he has his circle of CEOs. That's what they call themselves, you know, the five of them. Mm -hmm. And they'll go do their masterminds on Friday yeah. night. And, you know, he has his time to himself. And I have my time to myself with yeah. my friends. But ultimately, this is life that we choose to do together. So we're going to do it together. So, like, I'm coming to this podcast today. I was like, I'm nervous. I need you to come, too. Okay, you see, he's yeah. right here sitting on that couch yeah. with me, yeah. you know. Yeah. And that's just how it's supposed yeah. to be. And so we've literally learned how to communicate so that it's effective. We learn how to argue so that it's effective and it's just not yeah. us yelling at each other for no reason. We've learned how to apologize to each other. Mm. We've learned how to understand like when we need to get a little break from each other. Yeah. You know, we, we've we've been together a long time and so it took years to figure it out but we've been able to figure out what works for us. Yeah, you said something key that I want you to talk about because this is where people make the mistake in their relationships, mm -hmm. right? Learning how to apologize. You said you had to learn how to do that. Yeah. What was that lesson like? <laughs> and how many times have you had to learn it? Seven <laughs> times seven. What? <laughs> seven times 70. <laughs> I'm still learning it some days, you know. But it's so important because because sometimes that's all it takes is to say, I'm sorry. Mm. To just really make the situation go away. And that's yeah. what everything, that's whether you're in a relationship, it's a friendship. Yeah. It doesn't matter, you know, because sometimes our actions just come across in a way that we don't even expect them to come across. Mm. But I need my household to be at peace yeah and i know sometimes i can disrupt that peace <laughs> <laughs> and i know it and i admit it and i, yeah. I you know I, I know who i am and i know sometimes i can be hard to deal with i can mm -hmm. be hard to talk to and after it settles and i'm like dang halani you messed up mm -hmm. and i i have to say i'm sorry and it's the same thing for him you know he knows when he needs to apologize and it's yeah. it's just about being humble and being able to be vulnerable yeah i've said it before i said it while we were sitting here i lay my head next to this person every night he sees me at my worst i see him at his worst mm -hmm. so why can't i say i'm sorry mm -hmm. for messing up yeah and most men in conversation i've had with so many different men and friends they say that the hardest thing that they feel with mostly black women is that black women are not accountable and they do not apologize and yeah. you're saying that the reason you've been married for 21 years and together for 24 is you've had to learn how to be accountable and apologize absolutely yeah yeah i mean you've got to understand it's not about just you yeah and i think sometimes for us as black women we just feel like we have to be on all the time and we feel like we have to prove ourselves so much and navigate life in this way but you got to have a place or a space where you can just be you mm -hmm. and not have to have any false pretenses put on and be able to have that vulnerability you have to and be, saying sorry is just that. You're humbling yeah. yourself and you're saying, hey, I messed up. And that's okay. It is really okay. It doesn't make you weak. It doesn't make you less than. It makes you human. And it makes you, I think it makes you even more respectable, the fact that you're able to be like, hey, I messed up. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. And learn from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To say I'm sorry and learn from it. As we close out this interview, as we close. I don't want to close it out. <laughs> Listen, this thing has gone by so fast. Yes. I feel like I could talk to you all day because you have such a such a wealth of knowledge, I think, in so many different areas that people really may not know yeah. about you. But I really want, you know, with your daughter off to college, 24 years of being with one person, um, evolving and learning with a person mm -hmm. growing, what is this season teaching Halani? What is the season of your life teaching you right now? Whew. I think it's really teaching me to really tap into me as to who I am 
now because I'm different now than I was last year. Mm -hmm. So different. Like even just with um, certain businesses, I don't want to do them anymore. Yeah. And they're successful businesses. And I'm like, I just don't want to do it because I'm, I'm not happy doing it. I don't feel fulfilled doing it anymore. And so I think this season now is just teaching me to sit with me. My children are getting older. They don't necessarily need me in the same um, roles that they needed me when they were younger, you know? And so being able to just know who I am, what I need to be happy and to be in my, like be my optimal self and just really figure that piece out. Because if I can figure that out, that I can be present the way I need to be for those that I love. Yeah. What are you committed to? <laughs> I'm committed to, of course, my family. I'm committed to my faith. And I'm committed to being happy, mm. as happy as I possibly can be in this world. That's so freaking crazy. Yeah. But yeah, that's what I'm committed to. And now I'm committed to just this new venture that I'm going into because it's a whole new world and I'm excited about it. I'm really, really excited about this world of real estate because it's giving me something to strive for. It's giving me something to master, so to speak. Yeah. So, yeah. So new thing to master, new things to do. Mm -hmm. You say you're strictly focused on what makes you happy. Yeah. What is making you happy right now? Right now, it's making me happy that my marriage is in a very good place. My kids are happy, they're healthy, they're thriving. And I have this new venture. I'm excited about this. I don't think I've been this excited about something since I started in the fire service. And I think mm. it's because it's giving me something to do where I'm not sitting idle, where I'm not sitting and dwelling on the fact that one of my children, you know, one of yeah. my kids is gone. And it's just giving me something to just look for and the different avenues where I can spread my wings in this space. And I'm just, I'm excited. You're excited. Mm -hmm. Halani, it has been my pleasure to talk to you. You are so much more than Mrs. Two Weeks Out. <laughs> you are a, a real joy. Thank you. You are such a joy. You have such a radiant spirit. Even though you say you come across, take charge <laughs> and no nonsense, it is so much beauty. Thank there you. is so much God on you. And it is so evident. So I'm thankful that you decided to come and sit with me today. Vault, we got another good one for you. So thank you so much for joining. You can follow Halani at Mrs. Two Weeks Out on Instagram. You can check out all her content there and see her new venture of what she's excited about in real estate. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you subscribe. Enjoy the Vault Village. Until next time, y'all, eat well, give a damn, move your body every single day. Peace.